Lord, oh, you rescued me so, so I, I could stand, stand and sing. And sing. I, am I am a child. Let's lift it up. You split the sea so I could walk. You split the sea so I of your love today and let us see you for who you are and let give us grace to walk in true liberty let your name be glorified oh god in jesus mighty name hallelujah god bless you please be seated good afternoon and welcome to church this is the well oasis international where sons come to manifest this is our empowerment service. Uh, sorry, this is our celebration service. It looks like um, I feel like teaching some of those empowerment classes. I was like, hi, relational chemistry. I should have taught that. But <laughs> hallelujah. We're in the series, The Wheel of God, and this is part number seven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Last week, we looked at bending wheels. Of bending wheels we saw that everything that God did in giving us free moral agency in sending Jesus to come in ensuring that he lives it makes a way of escape for us every single thing that our father did was him bending his will towards us hallelujah and we said that our only response ought to be bending our will towards his own too hallelujah Hallelujah. Amen. As we continue to make our way down the wheel of God, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I must say that I have enjoyed preparing and teaching every installment so far. Amen. Last week when we focused on, with our focus was really on authority and the wheels. We looked at the authority of God and we said, if God has so much authority, why does he allow man the opportunity to step you know, or to say yes or no, to choose how man would respond, yes? And I told us that the only reason why that is the case is because God was bending his will to us. 
that he was showing us an example of how we ought to bend our wills to him. And I don't know if I said this last week, but maybe also to bend our wills to each other. Hallelujah. So that you see the example. You saw that Jesus could have said no. You said that Jesus could have sent the angels. We saw that Jesus could have done anything but come. We saw him in the garden of Gethsemane where he could have said, you know what? Lord, I thought I'll do it, but I won't do it anymore. Let's find another way. But he followed through. And when you look at all of that, I told us that it was God bending his will to ensure that you had a chance and to ensure that I have a chance. Hallelujah. So when we embrace his will, we bend our will as well. Just to say that while God can bring us part of his will by sovereignty and the other by instruction, it takes bending our wills to reach out and take what he has offered to us. Hallelujah. In the course of teaching this series, people have expressed many, many feedback, a lot of feedback to me. Every, different things they've said to me by feedback from when we started the first installment. And every time I get feedback, I hear something in the voice of the person. Those are, these are not the exact words that they used to give, feed me back. But if you ask me to um, describe the feeling, aggregate the feelings that are embedded in the feedback that I have received, in one word, it will be the word relief. I feel like a lot of people are relieved and they're like, oh my God, now that I can see that the will of God is really not as, you know, as hard as it looks, I stand a chance. It feels to me like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels to me like people are beginning to now see that, oh, I have a fighting chance in God. This thing about walking in the will of God is not the exclusive reserve of some kind of person. All of us have the opportunity and get to have the chance to walk in the will of God. Hallelujah. Men and women have expressed relief in understanding that even in matters of the will, we are not doomed as most of us have taught. And that feeling has informed today's installment titled the relief of mercy. The relief of mercy. Just so that I put it out there, the question that we're trying to answer today, and I know we'll answer, is what happens when I find myself, you know, refusing the will of God? Will God shut me out forever because I did not go? I did not um, embrace his will on time. Because that's how some of us feel, isn't it? We feel like, oh, I missed his will. Some people think that because someone asked them to marry them and they didn't marry the person, that they missed the will of God and so that may never happen again. Does God kill the one who has missed his will in one season or the other? Does God shut out the one or shut in the one or imprison the one who refused to choose the will of God when God made him the offer? Today, what I want to, if I will just um, rush to the end, in case you have somewhere to go, is that the mercy of God is the relief that God brings to us, whether we choose his will or we don't choose his will. What that means, therefore, is what happens? Another question is, what happens when I choose the will of God and I find myself in trouble by the will of God? The mercy of God will bring you relief. What happens when I do not choose the will of God? The mercy of God will bring you relief. I don't want us to ever forget that our God loved us. Loved us, sent his only son to die. And still loves us today and we continue to love us. So if there is anything that is important to the God of heaven, where you are concerned, it is not punishment. Do you understand it? It's not the first thing in his heart for you. The first thing in God's heart for all of us is how do I get this person to see how much I love them? And how do I get them to accept this love that I am extending to them? Do you see what I can see? So, hallelujah. Amen. So what does the word uh, relief mean? Relief. Relief, if you look at the dictionary, it defines relief as alleviation, ease, 
deliverance through the removal of pain, distress, and oppression. Alleviation, ease, or deliverance through the removal of pain, distress, and oppression. Relief is the act of reducing something unpleasant. When we talk about relief, we're talking about the feeling of happiness that occurs when something unpleasant or distressing stops or does not happen. Hallelujah. What is mercy? Mercy is God's active compassion which he dem demonstrates to the miserable. Mercy is God's active compassion which he demonstrates to the miserable. When we are in a time of deep distress and God activates his compassion to bring about relief, we have experienced his mercy. God's mercy. And I'm saying that by the will of God, God has a safety nest. If you remember, he says, the word says like this, there is no temptation that has befallen you that is not common to man. But with every temptation, what does he do? He makes a way of escape. That is the relief of the mercy of God. And just knowing that I may have taken the wrong turn, but the mercy of God will recalibrate my journey and take me through. It may be a long-winded road, but he can still direct me to where I was supposed to be going originally. It's just, I don't know about you, it's even greater relief than anything anyone has expressed to me in the last six installments of this teaching. Hallelujah. Do you understand this? So, I, 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 I know that yes, I have made mistakes. But I also know that mercy found me. I know that God is invested enough, even by his will, to show me mercy. So God is not this Sherubawan being somewhere who is waiting for you to get, you know, to fall by his will so that he can show you Pepe. God is not your stepmom. Do you understand that? Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read two translations. I'll read the New King James translation. And then I'll read the message translation. Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 1 to 6. And you he made alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this word, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. The state at which God met us before he showed us mercy is what verse 1 to 3 of Ephesians chapter 2 describes. Every decision we made was a decision to gratify the flesh. Every decision we made was powered by the prince of the power of the air. We made selfish decisions like the sons of disobedience. But something changed in verse number 4. In verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 2, it says, But God, say to your neighbor, but God. but God. Tell your neighbor again, but God. but God. He said, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So by the decisions of the flesh we made, by going with the sons of disobedience, by take, making the, following the path of, um, of the prince of the power of the earth, 
we were condemned. That's the only thing that should have happened to us. Hallelujah. But God stepped in because he's what? Rich in mercy. And by that mercy, his love was activated. It says, because of his great love, which he has loved us, his mercy showed forth. And even when we were dead, pay attention to the wordings. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Let's read it in the message translation. Ephesians chapter number 2 verse 1 to 6. It wasn't so long ago that you were married in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. We all did it, all of us, doing what we felt like doing, when we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. It is a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. Instead, immersed in mercy and with an incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did all this on his own with no help from us. Then he picked us up and set us down in highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Hallelujah. What I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit will communicate to you this afternoon by today's teaching is that number one, the mercy of God is the relief that reaches us when we find ourselves in the will of God. And it is painful. When we offend and step out of God's will because of his love, I want us to see that the relief that we find, that God, is pre that God has prepared a relief in his mercy for us. I want us to, I want the Holy Spirit to communicate to your spirit today that when we choose the will of God and it leads us down paths that are painful, oppressive and distressful, his mercy keeps us and brings us to relief. Either way, God is not exactly excited to let go of you. He's not, his first thing is not, my beggy fwe. That's not his first thing. His first thing is, how many, how many chances will I give him? And the thing I like about God is, when I have counted that I'm in chance number 21, God just sees a second chance. When I'm counting that this is the 35th time he's sending someone to come get me, God just sees a second chance. Because his mercy does not count. Hallelujah. That's why I said that mercy is God's active compassion. That's, this is not passive compassion. This is compassion that is active. Compassion that does work. Hallelujah. What this means is that mercy is not pity. When a man pities you, he looks at you and says, hey, hey, yao. Ha, oma shio. But he doesn't do anything about it. That's not what God is feeling. God is not going oma shio on you. Because he now he has lost, he, can't, he doesn't know what else to do. That's not what happens when we miss the will of God. Is this teaching um, an encouragement for people to say no to the will of God? Of course not. But is there honestly someone in this room or online today who has not missed the will of God at one point or the other? 
Some people are still living in guilt of something that happened 25 years ago. And I'm saying that the mercy of God has brought you relief. You may not have known it, but maybe that's why today my announcement to you is the mercy of God has brought you into relief. So you can step away from guilt. Understanding that God again is not doing what? My beggy foe. He wants you to excel. And that's why he gives you the opportunity over and over and over again for you to get it right. Hallelujah. We can therefore say that one of the goals of mercy is relief. One of the goals of mercy is relief. So that when the will of God becomes mysterious and confusing, when doing his will leads us, leads us or results in the unexpected, his mercy brings the relief that makes the journey bearable. When by his will you lose someone, his mercy brings the relief that makes it bearable. When by, he, uh, when by his will you lose something um, important or you find yourself unjustly punished for something you did not do, his mercy kicks in and brings the relief that makes it bearable. Hallelujah. To illustrate today's point, I will highlight two Old Testament characters, Bible characters. One, an offender against the will of God. And the other, a victim many times of, uh, of the will of God. And each, for both of them, the mercy of God came through and brought them relief. Then we'll look at one New Testament Bible character who was both an offender and a victim of the will of God. And yet, while he was an offender, the mercy of God showed up. While he was a victim, the mercy of God showed up. I'm hoping that when you live here today, the weight that you've been carrying for months, for years, some of us for decades, we will load them off. Because there's no need. Where God says, I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy, he meant it. It's not me. That when I don't like your face anymore, I'll change my mind. Do you understand it? Or when I find out things about you that don't quite, um, what's the word, that don't quite look like the picture you painted to me the first time, I withdraw my mercy. God is not like that. Do you see that? Jonah chapter 1. Jonah. We don't have time, so I'm not going to be able to read all of it. But Jonah chapter 1, from verse 1 to the end, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose and to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of God. Apparently, Joshua, uh, Jonah did not read Psalm 139. He did not read it. Where will I go from your presence? If he had read it, he wouldn't try. But you see, that's the thing when we don't like the will of God in the moment. We forget that we can't escape his face so because we don't like the will of god in the moment we attempt to run and that's just like running from your shadow let's see how far you will go even better than running from your shadow actually hallelujah so jonah was this prophet in the land at the time now the people of nineveh belonged in a nation called assyria the Assyrians were mean people, to put it mildly. The Assyrians' favorite hobby was to overrun a nation. The Assyrians would just wake up and decide we want to take this nation. 
whether the nation has offended or not, they enjoyed conquest. So they will mount themselves and then they will go against the nation. It's one thing to take a nation, to overrun a nation and make the people slaves to you. Maybe to uh, till the ground or to do work for you. But the Assyrians are even worse than that. When the Assyrians run over a nation, guess what they do? They will take all the leaders, they will behead them. Then they would hang their heads on the pole at the city gate. Then they will begin to sell everyone else in that, sea, in that nation are slaves to other people. Then they will plunder. Then when they finish plundering and taking what they want, they will raise the city to the ground. If Assyria attempted to take a nation or a city and the people resist, resist Assyria, they don't live to tell the story. Because Assyria will keep coming until they get what they want. When a nation resists or a city resists Assyria and Assyria finally have the upper hand, Assyria will take every man in that nation, dig the ground and bury them up to their head and leave them there until they died, buried half, you know, up to their neck. They'll be buried neck down and only their head will show. After a while, they will die. So Assyria should not receive mercy. Because some of us don't know why Jonah felt, ah, how? We can't, we can't be going to preach to Assyria to repent. If they repent, it's not good. Because they will not get their just recompense. So Jonah said, Lord, I heard you, but I need to run from your presence. I cannot go to Nineveh. I'm going to be headed to Tarshish. You know the account. On the way, the let's, in verse 4, it says, The Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down and fast asleep. Jonah is the first person that slept in a stormy ship. The next one was Jesus. <laughs> if you were today, I would say Jonah took something to sleep. It's not a clear I was using to sleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise. Call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. They said to one another, come, let us cast loss, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what have you done? Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this is the, this great tempest is because of me nevertheless the men rode hard to return to land but they could not for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them therefore they cried out to the lord and said we pray O lord please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood for you O lord have done so have done as it pleased you so they picked up jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. <laughs> when they saw Jonah's punishment, it wasn't even a punishment. They just saw God come for Jonah. They repented. When you go to chapter 2, you will find Jonah 
in the belly of the fish. Then, then in verse 1 it says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. Essentially, Jonah started to repent. And he repented and repented and repented. In verse 10, so the Lord spoke to the fish. And he vomited Jonah onto dry land. What did you think happened there? Mercy. Because when you go and you read, guess where they vomited Jonah? At the river bank of Nineveh. This time he didn't even need transport. They took him right where he should go. Hallelujah. Now the word of the Lord, verse 3, uh, chapter 3, came to Jonah the, Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. Long and short of the matter, Jonah gets to Nineveh. Before Jonah could say, people of Nineveh, repent. God is angry with you. They once are clothed, they repented. Ha! This very cruel set of people changed their mind. One minute preaching from Jonah. Jonah was not happy. Jonah went back and said, what nonsense. Why couldn't they harden their hearts? Because Jonah still felt that God made a mistake from wanting to give Assyria the chance to repent. The Bible said they repented. Jonah went and sat under a juniper tree and he was complaining. And he was complaining. The overarching principle why God sent Jonah to Nineveh is found in Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33 verse 11. Ezekiel 33 verse 11. Ezekiel 33, verse number 11. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? You know, we say God does not desire the death of sinners. That was the overarching principle why God sent Jonah to Nineveh. After all, when the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, um, what's his name? Abraham interceded. And God said, if I even find ten, I will not destroy the city. Do you understand that? So God was going to give Nineveh the chance. And Nineveh dropped the chance with both hands. But, you know, just because I've read it, I can tell you, when you go to the book of Nahum, that they still destroyed Nineveh. Because they went right back after a while. But in this instance, they laid hold of the mercy of God. And that brought them relief. So when in chapter 4 of Jonah, when in chapter 4 of Jonah, Jonah was complaining, God, I don't understand you. The people that did not do anything, that the ones that are suffering, these ones that we should just kill and know why they are dead, these are the ones you are showing mercy. In verse number... 10 from verse 10 of Jonah chapter 4. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand? and much livestock. On Friday, I was in the middle of coaching and counseling with someone, and I said to her, I said, lately I've been thinking about the prayer that Jesus prayed on the cross for the people who crucified him. Jesus prayed in that last hour. I said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. I said, Jesus is not confused. Jesus knows that this was premeditated murder. They had a, an elaborate plan on how to rope him in so that he would be nailed to the cross. Yet Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And I have been ruminating on it and been saying, I've been saying, God, Jesus, I don't understand this prayer. 
It's not, Father, forgive them. I see what they are doing, but I've chosen to forgive them. Jesus actually excused them. He said they are doing this thing because they do not know what they're doing. Then I remember that there was another scripture where he said that the God of this world has blinded their eyes. So when a man's eyes are blinded by the God of this world, he would not know what he's doing. And that was exactly how the people of Nineveh were. God said all these 120,000 people, look at it again in verse, in verse 11, who cannot descend between their right hand and their left. Now that we have taken, through it, this, through the, th taken this conversation through this filter, don't you feel like Nineveh required, deserved the chance that God gave them? Hallelujah. What I want you to know is that for Jonah, that God sent a fish to swallow, to now vomit him or throw him up at the edge of Nineveh. And then God reiterated his command for Jonah to go and obey. Mercy gave Jonah relief. The Bible said that Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And through that time, he prayed. Hallelujah. It was the mercy of God. And in the conversation that God had with Jonah in chapter 4 that I read to you, verse 10 and 11, it was the mercy of God that was still at play. Both Nineveh and Jonah were offenders against the will of God. And yet God brought mercy and relief. Hallelujah. If you go to um, Genesis 37, Genesis 37 you see the account of Joseph. Joseph, in Genesis 37, when we were introduced to Joseph, Joseph had a dream. By the will of God, God pulled the curtain aside and showed Joseph his future. All that Joseph needed to do from that point on was begin to walk an inch his way slowly to the manifestation of that will of God, yes? Yes. So Joseph saw the will of God for him. He came down and came to his brothers and his fathers and his stepmoms and he described or he shared with them what God told him was the will for his life. And his brothers took offense because it seemed that God's will for Joseph strumped and overshadowed their own lives. And from that point on, they didn't like Joseph. They already didn't like him because Joseph was favored somehow. But not realizing, it's by the dream they now realize that the favor that Joseph enjoyed was the favor that would be upon the one who would ascend to the place that the will of God has said they were sent to. So we saw Jonah, who by the will of God, the will of God by instruction, he made a mess of it, the mercy showed up. And the mercy of God showed up. In Joseph's own, uh, own case, by the will of God, by sovereignty, the will of God by sovereignty locked him into something that he did not apply for. Jonah, Joseph didn't go and say to God, I want to be the one that is above my brothers. That was not the conversation. But the will of God by sovereignty has singled Joseph out for greatness and his brothers didn't like that. What was the fallout of that? His father sent him to take food to his brothers and they decided that they would kill him and, take, and go and tell their father that he, got, he, he, was, um, that he, he died by, by a wild animal. For them to do that, they took him and they threw him in a well. The mercy of God showed up as the Midianites merchants. And one of them said, you know what? Let's not even kill him. Let's sell him. He's as good as dead when we sell him. So they fetched him out of the well and they sold him to the Midianites servant, um, um, merchants, slave merchants. Everybody would be like, Joseph just jumped from fry pan to fire. Because if they had left him in the pit, his brother Reuben had, had planned to come back and spring him. Now, Reuben walked away. They sold him to people that Reuben would never know. And they left. For you to know how this thing can be. It was from Pripan to fire because I read it. These men were Ishmaelites or Midianites. 
So you expect that because they were Midianite merchants, they will head towards Midian. But guess what? They sold him to someone in Egypt. So even if they had found out, his father found out from his brothers that they sold him, if, where would they go and look for him? Midian. But he wasn't there because they sold him to Egypt. But it was the mercy of God in operation. Because Joseph was living by the sovereign will of God. So they sent him and they sent him to Potiphar's house. In no few days he was the rave of Potiphar's house. As very soon they said Potiphar did not even know what he owned. He left everything to Joseph's because Potiphar could say, see that God was with him. And because of that Potiphar prospered. I need you to understand that when he said God was with him and Potiphar prospered, Joseph was not the one that prospered because Joseph was a slave. Joseph couldn't prosper. But because of his presence in Potiphar's house, Potiphar was prospering. Until the will of God showed up again. Because in Potiphar's house, Joseph would never meet the baker and the butler. So the will of God showed up again by the mercy of God and brought Joseph more relief. Before we knew it, Potiphar's wife had designs on Joseph. By the time Joseph said no, Potiphar's wife accuses Joseph of what Joseph did not do. Joseph was not even afforded the opportunity to say I did not do it. Yes, he was thrown in prison. Again, if you had not read the end of that account, it will be like from frying pan to bigger. He gets into prison. In a few days, he was the rave of the prison. The prison guard put him in charge. And because they put him in charge, he had the opportunity to receive the baker and the butler when they were sent to prison by Pharaoh. They dreamt. He interpreted their dreams, begged them to remember him, but he wasn't ready. They went out. Of course, the, um, what's his name? The butler was killed. Was it the butler that was killed? Or the baker? Sure. Sorry? The baker was, was hung, and the butler was restored to his job. If you were reading the story and you didn't know the end, you would say, Joseph, on, done, finish. This will of God, we shouldn't be following it. See this man that is even trying to follow the will of God. Because I mean, when Potiphar's wife showed up in front of him, one who is smart and wants to get ahead would do what Potiphar's wife was asking so that he would gain more favor in the house and be entrenched at the Lord of the manor. Maybe if Potiphar's wife is willing and he's willing, they can both kill Potiphar. And then he would take over everything that Potiphar had because Potiphar's wife liked him. But he would just have ended up not by the will of God, only as the head of Potiphar's household when he, what God by his will said he would become was prime minister of Egypt. So the mercy of God will cause Pharaoh to dream. Pharaoh would dream and there will be not one person in all of Egypt who can interpret Pharaoh's dream. And because it was hard, the baker, saw, the uh, butler suddenly remembered that he had done something bad. Someone helped him in prison and he did not remember to mention the person. And Joseph was sprung. And the rest, as they say, is history. The difference between Joseph and Jonah was Jonah was running from doing the will of God. Joseph was happy to do the will of God. When Potiphar's wife came to him, he said to Potiphar's wife, he said, I cannot do this wicked thing and sin against God and then my master. So he was doing his best to walk in the will of God. When the, the baker and the butler dreamt, he said to them, God is the one that gives the interpretation for dreams. So every step of the way, Joseph was giving glory to God by his will. And yet Joseph just kept sinking and just kept sinking and just kept sinking. Until, of course, Pharaoh dreamt 
and the one that was forgotten became a delightsome land. The relief of the mercy of God. The relief of the mercy of God. The relief of the mercy of God. If you go to the New Testament, you see the account of what's his name, Paul. Paul, at the beginning of his life, was an offender against the will of God. Paul was an offender against the will of God. If you go with me to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. He says, I thank God, I thank Christ Jesus, who our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He was an offender. If he had to get what was coming to him, by the grace of God, what should happen? But by the mercy of God, he received relief. And how did God do it? He showed up in Acts chapter, I believe in Acts chapter 9, on the way to Damascus. What was Paul's assignment? Then he was Saul. He was going to persecute the church. Still doing everything against the will of God. But the mercy of God showed up, blinded him. And from that journey, his life, from that moment, his life started to do a turnaround. And before we knew it, Paul had become an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Paul started to suffer for the will of God. He became exactly a, a, a what do they call it, a victim of the same will that he was an offender against. If you look at Acts 16, Acts chapter 16. Acts 16 from verse 16 says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her master's much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul greatly anointed and said to the spirit, I command you. In the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he went out of her. Out, he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs that are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into the prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. You know the rest of that. How they began to pray. And they began to worship. And guess what? The prison was shaken from its foundation. The, um, the bands of the chains that bound them were broken. But they remained. And we see that the one who used to be an offender was now a victim. And yet the thing that reached him was mercy. If you look at Paul in Acts chapter 27, Acts 27 verse number 18, Acts 27 verse 18, Acts 27 verse 18. And because we were exceedingly tempered tossed, the next day they lighted the ship. On the third day we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our very own hands. And you go on and on. When you read, you will find that he was shipwrecked at some point. At some point they even threw him overboard. But if you really want to see the chronicle of, Saul's, um, of Paul's... Um, um, woes or perils go with me to 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians 11 verse 22 2 Corinthians 11 from verse 22 are they Hebrews? so am I are they Israelites? so am I 
Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. This is Paul chronicling his victimhood by walking by the grace of God. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more, more frequently. In deaths often. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often. In paris of waters. In paris of robbers. In paris of my own countrymen. In paris of the Gentiles. In paris in the city, in Paris in the wilderness, in Paris in the seals, in Paris among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak and I'm not weak, who's made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation. If I must boast, I will boast which, in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king was guarding the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. mercy of God. How do you think that Paul was able to weather all of this? The love of God brought him mercy that, and that mercy extended grace to him. And by that grace, he was able to withstand the things that would have killed anybody. As we sit here today, or maybe you are online, I know without a shadow of doubt that there are many things that only the mercy of God can walk us out of. So as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking there are people who are suffering because of unfair treatment. They did nothing. But they have been branded something. And for that reason, they are suffering. The mercy of God is what will bring you relief. Because if by the will of God you suffer, by the will of God, the mercy of God would hold you up. When I think of the account of Ruth, Naomi, and Opa, and how they lost their husbands, and their life in one day was okay, the next day their life was shutting down. And in the grief of that loss, it was the mercy of God that brought the relief that Ruth decided that no matter what, she would go with Naomi. And that's how that mercy brought her to the place of restoration. So even if you are here today, and you, by the will of God, someone died that you love. I know you don't even want to live a day after they died. But you see, by the mercy of God, he will keep you. You will find yourself one day, second day, third day, three years, ten years, fifteen years. You still have the memories. You still have the pain. But the mercy of God is how you keep going. Some of us are struggling with handicaps. And we're saying, I wish I was like everybody. Maybe I won't have to deal with this thing. But by the will of God, that's where you are. Because nobody wakes up and thinks, maybe I should be handicapped, yes? Maybe I should have a disability. That would really be cool. But if by the will of God you found yourself there, what do you do? I saw in the Bible that Mephibosheth was dropped as a child and he became lame in both feet. But one day, the one that was confined to the house of a servant and was fed whatever the servant felt he should eat, one day, the mercy of God remembered him. And the king in sitting started to look for someone from Jonathan's house to be a blessing to. And they went and they brought Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth by himself said, I am a dog. But the king said, you can sit at the table. 
And so men have looked at you and said, you don't count. But the mercy of God is about to bring you to the seat of the table, at the table. Because if that's where you end up by the will of God, that's where you end up by the will of God. And I was thinking about Mephibosheth and it occurred to me that when Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth was a prince waiting to become a king. And even though he was now lame in the leg, he's lost everyone, he still found his way to the table of the king. Mercy brought relief. Some of us are bonded under the weight of guilt. And I remember that David had this running thing with Bathsheba that became something that he couldn't, he couldn't boast fully just stand even his his children used it against him ultimately but i know that one day the mercy of god moved nathan the prophet to go and confront him and in that place of that confrontation guess what the mercy of god did the mercy of god opened a way and all that david had to do was to confess and repent and David will be restored. And is it not shocking that the same Bathsheba that David had committed adultery with and all of that is the one who gave birth to the son, King Solomon, the wisest king that ever lived. The mercy of God. The relief of the mercy of God. Some of us are overwhelmed by suffering. It's never enough. Just when it looks like you are getting respite, something else tumbles on you. And I checked my Bible and I saw Job. Job had issues. He, Job's issue was that he was too blessed. So he tried with trepidation. But one day the mercy of God, the will of God decided to expose Job to the devil. And Job, God said to, Job, to the devil, have you considered my servant Job? Job's wife was so infuriated when things crumbled that she said to Job one day, she said, you know what? Just curse God and die. Job's friends gathered and said, I, we thought you were a righteous man. But if this kind of thing would happen to you, it must be that you have been pretending. Confess your sin and let us see. But I looked at the end of Job. And the Bible says to me, that his latter, his, his end, his latter was better than his former. The daughters he had in the end were more prettier than the ones that he lost. His business doubled. And that was when I realized that when God said that there is no temptation that has befallen man that is peculiar to us. And when he made the promise that with each one of them he'll make a way of escape, God was serious. By his mercy, he's invested in bringing us relief. And that's why today, someone will think that when we're teaching the will of God, we will bring a lot of condemnation. But the more I research to teach the will of God, the more I see how God bends over backwards to make room for us. Again, not so that we would continue in sin. God forbid, just because grace abounds does not mean that we continue in sin. But just so that all of us will recognize that if we did not make it, it will be our fault. It would never be because God did not give us room. Take a look at it. Exactly what do you want to confess? Exactly what do you want to complain about? That you can't find in the life of Ruth, the life of Jephthah, Joseph, the life of Paul, the life of Jonah, and all the other men that I, 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 I highlighted this, this afternoon. And yet, God's active, active compassion shows up. And he says, yes, I do not desire the death of sinners. So I'm going to send my prophet to go and evangelize them because I don't want them to die in sin. 
And when the prophet says, Lord, we can't be evangelizing this kind of people. God will rather, by his mercy, lock down his own prophet than allow the people of Nineveh be destroyed on that account. I don't know about you. Every time I open myself up to study about the will of God, guess what I found? I find, I find myself more grateful than the last time. I find myself more grateful. And I've started to ask myself, so who exactly told us that the will of God was that scary? That's why that song was such an apt one. It says, you split the seas. Celebrate the relief of the mercy of God. Can we celebrate the relief of the mercy of God? Unless you've not been in a place where you felt like, I have sinned and I've fallen short of the glory of God. I don't deserve to be forgiven. And yet you receive forgiveness. Or unless you haven't found yourself in walking in the will of God and by the will of God, God says to you, you are going under the knife but you dare not ask me to not let you die. And you're sitting there, you're wondering to yourself, but I have been doing your will as best as I can. I'm standing here because I have been going through everything that you called me to go through. How am I the one that has to contend with these things today? But every time that Joseph went through that, Joseph became a better person. Because the journey of becoming is a journey that by the will of God, we will be processed through. And look at us today. Speak to God. Be grateful at least. Say, Lord, I am grateful for the relief of your mercy. Lord, I am grateful for the relief that your mercy brings me. Lord, I am grateful for the relief that your mercy brings me. Thank you, Jesus, because your mercy has brought me relief. Because you rescued me so I can stand and sing. Look at it. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Of God. Thank you, Lord. Whoa, Thank you, Lord. You split the sea you, so I could walk for having mercy. Right Thank you. through it, my fears are drowned in perfect love. You, you rescued me so I can stand and sing. I am a child. Whether it's guilt, whether it's loss, whether it's the fact that you are incapacitated in one way or the other, whether it is the fact that you found yourself in a place you never thought you'd find yourself in. Today I commend to you the active compassion of God. The compassion that makes him step down from eternity into the mud that you and me are. And so that he can restore us to himself. Are you not grateful for that love? Father Lord, thank you. And if you're in here or you're online and you're yet to give your life to Jesus. It's the only thing you can do. Your only response to this level of love. Your only response to this level of love. Your only response to this level of mercy is to embrace the one who's brought you active compassion. If you're online or you're in this room and you're yet to give your life to Jesus, today is the day that you say with me, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Father Lord, we thank you. We are so grateful for that which you've done. We return all the glory. We return all the honor. We are excited for your mercy. Thank you for your compassion. 
thank you for your active compassion thank you Lord because whether we are offended or we are victims your mercy the relief of your mercy can reach each and every one of us Lord we return all the glory all the honor and all adoration to you thank you Father in Jesus mighty name we have prayed hallelujah thank you so much God bless you